We have Kevin Kimley. I'm going to get started here. Welcome to Flagship Fridays. What if innovators forum? As you know, we have 29 really fabulous leaders and influencers uh, on our forum and really the feedback that we've had has been phenomenal in terms of the students feeling like they have access to really unique tips about how not just how to do technical innovation, but also how to behave, how to learn, how to access, how to position yourself to be successful, not just as an innovator, but even as a future professional, how are we contributing? And that is also part of an innovation mindset. So the information that we're learning here is just terrific. Today, we have uh, some really unique, uh, unique guests and some unique co-hosts. We have Kevin Kimley with us, who is the Director of Ag Entrepreneurship Initiative, and he will be responsible for our Did You Know Innovation Did You Know fact. I'll get to him in a minute. We have Maddie Fugate. Maddie, could you introduce yourself, please, and show yourself on camera for a moment? Do we have Maddie here? There we go. Yes, it's loading right now. Hello, my name is Maddie Fugate. I have been involved in the livestock industry for 19 years now, and I have raised pigs majority of that. But further than that, it goes back um, being a seventh generation pig farmer on both sides of my family. There is. And Maddie's going to be co-hosting with us today. Maddie, um, feel free to leave your uh, uh, camera on as you're comfortable, and we will all try not to get motion sickness. <laughs> Okay, and um, I am uh, Karen Kearns, the President's Entrepreneur in Residence, as well as working with GM Oliver, part of the Innovation Center. And Nakaya, would you introduce yourself, please? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nakaya Rucker, and I am the External Relations Director at the University Library here at Iowa State. And I um, help co-moderate this amazing series. So I will be the one kind of popping in asking questions from a student's point of view. And I also encourage everyone to engage in this conversation via the Q&A. Don't wait until the very end to submit your questions. We're going to ask them in real time. So I encourage you any insights, thoughts, feedback, questions, please be sure to utilize that um, Q&A at the bottom. So thanks for joining us again. Thanks, Nakaya. And we have Anna Luge. Anna, will you introduce yourself? And I would guess Bill's had some experience in the countries that you have lived in and visited and are born in. Hi, I'm Anna. So today I'm going to say it because I just had a meeting talking about diversity. I'm a citizen of the world. Um, Portugal, Spain, Italy, England, Netherlands, uh, United States, Canada. I I'm from the College of Design, uh, teaching things like, ooh, design thinking <laughs> and uh, group dynamics and creativity and problem solving and disruptive innovation. Um, I'm very, 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 very happy to have Bill today. Um, and we're going to have, I think we're going to have a, a great conversation. So um, if you don't mind, Bill, I'm going to make the disclaimer. Usually I make a lot of notes. And if my face goes like, oh, ah, it means that you said something that I have a connection with the students and I want to ask a question on behalf of the student about how the processes of innovation connect with their lives. Um, but welcome and let's have fun. Yeah, and Kevin, um, before I introduce Bill here, uh, I would love for you to be our did you know innovation fact to start off the yeah. week as we do every week, because uh, ag entrepreneurship is really the pioneer that started this whole ball rolling. And we are building on the shoulders of something Kevin Kimley started many years ago and now has huge um, impact and influence. Kevin, not just the ag entrepreneurship, but might you also talk about the ag startup engine? Sure, Karen, Bill, everybody else, glad to be with you today. Um, yeah, the Agricultural Entrepreneurship Initiative at Iowa State University um, dates back about 12 or 13 years. I've been here for 11 years and happy to work with students and others on campus that are change makers and different thinkers and entrepreneurs and innovators and always pleased to meet um, people like Bill that are, are out doing it in the world. But doing ag entrepreneurship initiative, in, innovative things in agriculture at Iowa State University is nothing new. And it didn't at all start with the Agricultural Entrepreneurship Initiative. And I think Bill's comments will relate back to some of those things with the history of PIC and Iowa State University being 
you know, playing a role in supporting people doing creative and entrepreneurial things in agriculture. So I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. And might you just briefly overview the Ag Startup Engine and the successes of the students there? Yeah, so four years ago, um, we noted that we had some number of students that were starting higher risk, but higher potential reward agricultural technology businesses and that having some early funding for those businesses might be a good thing. So a group of 10 investors came together to start a small fund called the Ag Startup Engine. And so that investment fund invests twenty-five to $50,000 in early stage agricultural technology ideas. And so it is now, well, soon we'll have invested in 15 companies, which is really good. But the little bit of money that Ag Startup Engine has invested has been leveraged into about $30 million of additional investment from others. Two of the companies um, in the portfolio, Smart Ag, in November of last year, sold to Raven Industries and Performance Livestock Analytics, sold to Zoetis in April. So the entrepreneurs, the investors, the employees, the team members that have been a part of the companies have been doing just really great work um, in building great businesses that are making a huge difference. Yeah. And I, I might comment too, Kevin, in addition to the amazing successes that you're magnifying for our university, uh, Kevin was the one who roped me into this whole ball of wax in the first place. And really, um, I, I defer to him often as an innovation resource. And um, also, we'll be doing a session in the spring with Anthony Sardella on the innovators ethics and creating an ethics platform as you build and grow your uh, invention, innovation, so on and so forth. Really uh, um, quite a resource. So with that being said, I'm gonna introduce uh, what, who I call one of the 10 smartest people I know in the world. Bill promptly responded, I must not know any people, but I do know quite a few people. Mm. Um, Bill is the chief operating officer for PIC, the world's leading pig genetics business. PIC has operations in more than 40 countries and forms part of genus PIC the global animal biotechnology company, which focuses on pioneering animal genetic improvement to help nourish the world. Bill has led PIC since 2012, following a varied career within the company. He's held operational roles in Europe, South America, and the US. He was appointed as general manager of PIC North America in 2007, becoming chief operating officer of Genus Americas in 2010, before moving to his current role. He holds a um, veterinary degree and a PhD from the University of Minnesota, which we will not hold against him. So, um, but also, Bill will also talk about his role um, with Iowa State University. And I uh, must say, I met Bill um, when I was CEO of Kearns and Associates, which is a livestock risk management company. And Bill, was at the time really so impactful and not just working in the business, he really elevated people's capacity to think about working on their business and looking at that global vision, casting way out in front and having people catch up to it in their own unique ways. So I am very pleased uh, to introduce Bill Christensen and Kevin, I will turn it over to you. All right, Bill, um, for a whole bunch of different reasons, we are looking forward to your remarks. The pork industry, in the United States at least, is centered in, in Iowa. So a number of our students that sit in our classes at Iowa State either come from an operation that raises pigs or have done internships in the pork industry in some form. So we look forward to the story of PIC, your career, and some of the lessons that you've learned over the course of time. Thank you, Kevin and, and Karen, for the very kind words. Um, it's, it's an honor to be part of this. I think it's really unique. Um, the more I'm learning about this whole program, and it again speaks to uh, leadership that, that Iowa State has demonstrated in agriculture. Um, I, I thought maybe the way to go about this is to, to start a little bit about myself and, and, and really what are some of the influences I've had in, in my career as it relates to innovation? I promise that we will eventually get back to innovation, but uh, um, I, I do have to start by, by talking about some of those influences. Um, and, and, and for me, it, it's, it really began with, with family. I'm, I'm one of 10. Um, and in fact, um, 
nine boys and one girl. So I always, <laughs> I, I always remarked that we would have made a good bore multiplier. Um, <laughs> but it, um, I, I'm number six in that group, and it's it's uh, uh, they're very kind of determined and overachieving bunch. Um, um, running businesses and starting businesses and doing a lot of different things. And so that was a huge influence from, from day one, really, through that process. And to give you an example of that, um, to, to basically put myself through university, I, I used to build grain bins in the summer, back in the days when that was, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a big business. And, and I've often said I, I don't put a lot of my degrees. I, I very much respect degrees, but I don't have degrees on my wall except my my grain bin building degree, <laughs> which is a picture of me building bins. And and the reason I put it there is just to remind myself of the different things I learned in that, and which was, you know, we we got paid by the pound, and so if uh, steel that we put up. So if you if you um, if you built bins very fast, you could make a ton of money. If you built them slow, or you had to come back into repairs, you could lose money. I learned to hire uh, people and, and, and unfortunately fire people. I, I learned to deal with farmers. Um, I learned to deal with, you know, all the aspects of putting that bin together and where and some of the, some of the issues that come along with that. I learned to collect money. Uh, I learned a lot of practical things there. And I actually, I, 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 I learned it from a brother four years older than me and I ended up teaching a brother younger than me. So it was, it was a, it was a great mechanism to, uh, to, to help set myself up and ultimately go to university. But, but I learned a lot in that process. So that was, a, that was an influence. I had an older brother, David, who, um, I have an older brother, David, who, who was a, a, a veterinarian. And he had a big influence on me to, to end up going to, to vet school. And then in, in vet school, I met uh, a guy by the name of Professor Al Lehman. And really, Al, in a, in a number of different ways, ended up being a, a key individual in my life, uh, a real mentor in any kind of definition of that term. And, and he was that for many, many people across the industry, be it in academia or, or commercially. Um, we could spend all day, I think, talking about Al Lehman's stories. Unfortunately, he died quite young in 1992, but had a huge influence uh, that lives on today with, with all of us that were, that were influenced by that. Um, and to give you a, a sort of an example and, and keep this thing going in stages, um, I actually, at the end of vet school, went down to interview with Al at Swine Graphics. He had just left the University of Minnesota and was with, along with Gene Barrick, um, had, had started Swine Graphics. And he, he was interviewing me for a veterinary position there. And at the same time he was interviewing me for that, he was advising me to stay on to graduate school and get a PhD. So I was left sort of wondering, you know, did he just think I wasn't a very good vet? Which was an interesting possibility. Um, or, you know, in, in fact, he, he had this uncanny ability to pull out decisions from people, you know, that, that, that you, to get you to, to sort of recognize and understand what you really wanted to do. And he was fantastic at that and advised me to then go on and get my PhD. Um, you know, there's luck and serendipity along the way, too. Um, and for me, as a graduate student, that had to do with everything to, to do with timing about what I was working on, which started out being called mystery swine disease and ended up at the end of the PhD being PRS. Um, and it was an absolute fantastic time to be a graduate student. First of all, that program at the University of Minnesota at that time um, had you know a number of international faculty and students and working on all kinds of different things. You were exposed to many, many different things. But but as far as that disease or that problem, everything was new. You know everything you worked on, be it from the pathology side of it or ultimately from the virology, uh, the basic economics of the disease. Everything was new and and publishable and exciting. I learned about things like IP. Um, actually, some of the some of the work I was doing with the diagnostic lab with Dr. Jim Collins, I, I wasn't able to share part of my PhD work with my advisor because he had an agreement with a, with a different uh, pharmaceutical. So, I mean, it was, it was fascinating time to be a graduate student. And I think that kind of curiosity bit that was all, always inside of me, and we're gonna come back to that when we talk specifically about it, innovation, was really um, developed, I guess, at that time in, in my career. 
Having said that, again, through my mentor, through Al Lehman, I was linked up with, with this company called PSE, Pig Improvement Company. And, and talk just a, a minute about kind of PIC and the beginning of PIC, because I, I do think it relates directly to what we're talking about today. PIC was formed uh, in 1962 by five uh, British pig farmers in a pub. The pub was called the White Hart. Um, and they were part of a pig discussion group that got together every month. Um, and one of the things they discussed was- Wait, 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 Bill, you cannot pass over what the name of them, what they call themselves. And the Wallingford Pig Discussion Group. Yeah, that's that's what they were. Thinkers, thinkers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That bit. So the, the part about being in a pub. Uh, yeah, thinkers, doers, and drinkers. I think is what they call themselves. Um, our PSE has been described that way sometimes. So, so really, the foundation of the company was was the application of science and economics to pig breeding, um, and. You know, really, they wanted to make a better pig in the first instance for themselves, and then ultimately for other customers to make them more successful. And and that really is is the reason we're still in business today. But if we go back to that science piece, there was a heavy influence from day one from Iowa State in the work of Professor Lush in animal science there. And and really, if you go further back before Lush, if you look at uh, you know, some of the stuff that Henry Wallace did with Pioneer Seed Corn and this whole idea of, of using hybrids and heterosis to, to accelerate your program was, was, you know, counter current to the conventional thinking. That was a real innovation because it's kind of purebred mentality and purebred societies had dominated things up until that time globally. And so really PSC were pioneers building off of a lot of the science that, that uh, had been developed and by Professor Lush and others. And then, you know, over subsequent years, if I look, um, certainly the work, and I've had direct work with, with Hank Harris, but he's been fundamental in a lot of the things PSC has done on the health side and kind of our approach to research and as a critical member of the faculty there at Iowa State, uh, moving on to Max Rothschild on the genetic side. And that, that's just continued over many years um, to the point today, you know, we have great relationship, for example, with the diagnostic lab with Roger Main and that group uh, to the point where Maria Clavajo is a 50% is a appointment at Iowa State and a 50% oh. appointment with us. Um, so we very much continue on that path with, with Iowa State. Um, and also, I would say through the efforts of Tim Heiler, I don't know if Tim's on the call today or not, but uh, Tim's an account manager with us and really is tasked, one of the things he's tasked with is identifying, recruiting, and helping develop young people in our business. And certainly, um, the, the, the majority of those young people are coming out of Iowa State University today, to the point where I push back on them to say, we need a little more diversity, maybe the odd Minnesotan or something, but uh, <laughs> they don't go for that. Um, so in my time at PSC, and, and Karen said it in the introduction, I, I did a you know pretty wide variety of jobs. And I, and I think the uh, you know, the real, the real issue became, and I was trained as a scientist and joined doing that sort of work, but that wasn't where my natural kind of proclivity lay. I, I uh, at one point, after being challenged of, was I going to go down this technical path or the commercial path within the company? Um, I actually did some work with some different personality inventory stuff. And the guy who was helping me with it came back the first results and he looked at it and he said, well, you're not a scientist, you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> so after spending, you know, 12 years in post-secondary education, I figured out uh, I really wasn't a scientist. But to, to be fair, I think it's, it's, I'm emblematic of many individuals within PIC that are kind of comfortable in both worlds. And it's really critical that we have that link um, that, that can uh, yeah, understand enough of the science and how it gets applied and the commercial world to make those things work together. And so I think that's been a big plus. Um, another thing with all those jobs, I, I would talk about individuals within PIC. Um, you know, the word uh, diversity can have multiple meanings, I guess, for, 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 for people. But um, I mean it in, in the sense of diversity of thought within the company from the beginning. Um, we really embraced, um, I'm going to call them characters, it, 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 you know, yeah. um, 
good thinkers in all sorts of different ways. It doesn't matter where they came from. I mean, you know, today in this office in Hendersonville in Tennessee, we're about 120 here. And last time I counted up, there's like 22 different nationalities. I mean, we, we really we really are embracing um, diversity of, of thought and diversity in a lot of other different ways. Um, another example I'd link to Iowa State of this, what I'm talking about, David Hollier, who was actually British, uh, was involved early on in the company, um, ended up traveling the whole world. Literally, the stories within the company are that he traveled the whole world with a paper bag and a toothbrush and a T-shirt and it, um, ended up spending many years in China and coming back and working with Hank and others uh, at Iowa State along the way. So that's kind of some background and and some of the influences on what I think about innovation. But as I tried to prep for this today, I wondered, you know, kind of what definition do people use? And I, and I suppose being that we are a technology company, people within the business and externally, people immediately would, would I think move towards innovation in a, in a technical or a product kind of format. And clearly that's part of it. I think it's much wider than that. But, but if you look at things like gene editing as a platform, what that's potentially going to do to the business going forward, or even uh, how we apply genomics in a single step fashion today. Th those are examples of innovation, of you know, changing the way we do things um, that have made a huge issue. But I would argue within PIC over the years, I think a lot of the innovation has happened in things like business model. Mm -hmm. And people don't you know, naturally put innovation in business model. We tend to think of this bright new shiny product, but in fact, um, a lot of our business model globally has evolved with the evolving industry globally, where we're actually delivering genetic improvement, disseminating genetic improvement into their pyramid, whatever level works for them. And we get paid a royalty on the bottom, which links our business success with their business success. And I think it's been a huge part of and bring stability uh, as well. So I think it's been a huge part of the success of PIC over time. And that was a real innovation as an example. Um, you know, well, I would say, I, I wonder if, uh, just to think about one of the reputations your company has is for Mavericks and Cowboys. And <laughs> to your point about that sort of organic nature of, you mentioned character, that organic nature of innovation also coming from how you empower people. I'm wondering if you might comment for a moment on the innovators, how you empower people to innovate within your company as a model. Yeah, I, I, I'll touch on that a little bit when we talk about risk and, and kind of curiosity Good. and cur courage. And if I, don't, if I don't answer it directly, Karen, remind me Great. And, and I'll jump in. I, um, it, last thing I wanted to say is broadening this definition of innovation is, you know, some of the things I've just already touched on, on people recruitment and development and the diverse kind yeah. of, uh, approach that we get, I think is, is innovative. And it's, it's certainly part of our culture that we try and guard and in the first instance, but build upon and improve. Um, so after going through all these various different definitions, I, I tried to boil it down. And a big part of it to me is, is creating positive change. And I, and I think that's a lot, you know, it's a, that's pretty broad, right? And we can adapt that to a lot of things. But as I think about all the different ways we innovate, that 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 to me is 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 at the core of it. So then I thought, what are, what are some of the elements that make up that in innovation? And I've already touched on curiosity being a critical one. And part of what I mean by curiosity is really open mindedness to be to be able to to you know take information in from all different areas and, and try and figure out how can I adapt to your business. I, there's a, there's a quote I like um, about having an open mind. It, it, it starts, it, it is impossible for a person to begin to learn what he thinks he already knows. And that's from Epictetus, uh, a, a, a Roman stoic. Um, and I think that really sums it up. We have to, we have to absolutely uh, even if we're having success, and that's that's the time I think it becomes most difficult to to keep that open mind and, and and always understand there might be another way, a better way to to change and do things. The the second thing I thought I, I said I would touch on is is risk and really the attitude towards risk. Um, the, the the real founder in that group of five British pig farmers was a, a guy by the name of Ken Woolley, and um, 
Ken is uh, buried in Kentucky, not far from our office here. And actually the footstone on his grave has the phrase, who dares wins, uh, which also happens to be, by the way, the SAS um, motto. Um, and that, but that really, to me, sums up Ken Woolley. He was an absolute entrepreneur. Um, you know, kind of later, some of the success of PSC came with, with uh, other individuals balancing him somewhat. But um, he, he set the foundation for our attitude towards um, risk and, and taking chances and our attitude towards failure. And I, I think that's really important on this innovation piece. Um, and it doesn't mean, you know, carte blanche, we all just have a license to go out and do silly things, right? It, you know, we don't like to make mistakes twice, as an example. Um, but but I, but I think, you know, encouraging people to take some of those risks, I, I often, amongst our veterinarians, uh, remind them that, you know, if the answer is no all the time, because we're not going to take any risk, well, then you really don't need veterinarians, right? Mm -hmm. So, so our, our job is to identify those risks, figure out how to mitigate them and, and, you know, thoughtfully figure out when to take them. But, but yeah, I, I, I think it's absolutely part of innovation is making sure that you uh, take risks along the way. Um, the next piece I'd say, is, and I ran across a quote on this one too, from Steve Jobs, and that's focus and, and saying no to things. Uh, I think this one gets overlooked a lot. And I know it's absolutely critical in our business around the world. I, I go back to it over and over again with teams around the world. So the quote goes like this, people think focus means saying yes to the thing you, you've got to focus on, but that's not what it means at all. It means saying no to the hundred other good ideas that, that there are. You have to pick carefully. I'm actually as proud of the things we haven't done as the things I have done. Innovation is saying no to a thousand things. Um, so again, uh, Steve Jobs, I, I think that's a great quote. Um, and, and it's a discipline step. Um, human nature, we always want to try and be all things to all people. And, and I, don't, I don't think you have success or innovate when you do such a thing. The last piece I want to talk about on that is, is really... Um, I'm going to put it under the heading. I don't know. I have a better heading. Courage. Um, and and I, I mean that in a few different ways. One, maybe the more obvious one is, you know, when you're challenged along the way to have the courage to face those challenges and overcome them. Um, so an example of that would be years ago in PAC, when I actually when I came back from Europe. Whoops. Bill lost you there a little bit. Kevin, well, I imagine we'll pick Bill back up. Uh, comments, Kevin, on some of the things that those qualities, the innovator, curiosity, flex. Oh, there we are, Bill. Oh, sorry. No worries. Uh, yeah, I'm on my phone. Another call came in. Um, so, <laughs> so in the, uh, you know, late 80s and early 90s PRS spread all over. We as a brain stock supplier were positive. We were quite open about that. Customers were positive. Everybody was getting on with things. Well, then along the way, we figured out, hey, this virus uh, changes rapidly, evolves, new strains develop. And just because you're positive doesn't mean you're protected. So almost overnight, we had to figure out how to get rid of PRS and in our entire 150,000 sow pyramid of multiplication, which was a daunting task. And, and I think you know, we set it out and, and chopped it up into doable sort of bits as, as you do on these things and, and really over communicated and told that story over and over. But I, I can tell you all along the way, there are plenty of people inside the company, not, not just what externally people might have thought, but inside the company, they never thought we could do it. They thought we were kind of crazy to even try. And, and I think that sort of uh, single minded focus and having the courage to do things can take us a long ways. The other thing. But not only, how many pigs, like when you talk, I think to give our audience an a understanding of the massive impact of that, because you know it. So when you're talking about solving this disease and why it required courage, how many pigs, how big was this problem? Oh, yeah, no, it was huge. Right? Uh, 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 yeah. I mean, it, it continues to this day, right? And we've got vaccines that help in certain situations and other management uh tools we've got you know filtration and other things to prevent farms getting infected but it's still it's still a huge issue going forward that we're continuing to work on um 
the second piece of courage that I want to talk about is is the courage to change something that's successful. Um, and 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 that's again not an easy thing. Um, you know, we 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 absolutely want to defend all the time, and that's just not the right way forward, in my opinion. And and you know, I. I'll give an example. I don't know if it's a good example or not, but, but PSC in, in North America, um, you know, 15 plus years ago was very successful, was a leading um, research company in, in, in the U.S. And at that time in the U.S., we would have had about 1,200 employees. Um, well, between then and now, I would argue we're more successful in a number of different measures. We actually have 120 employees that are U.S., based. Um, now, I'm not talking about the whole global company, but um, all that to me, it, it took courage to change. And it wasn't head office saying, you know, here's a gun to your head, guys cut costs. It wasn't about that at all. It was about moving up the pyramid and working with customers and adapting as customers consolidated and gotten larger, um, that we need different kind of resource, more specific um, experience, technical resource at the top of a pyramid rather than a big wide base. And I think a lot of, uh, a lot of companies and a lot of people, um, you know, would have tried to just defend the past model that would work. And, and we very much look at it as you've got to constantly change to, to, to get better and to, and to innovate. So that was kind of the general stuff I had, Karen. I, I jotted down some ideas on kind of advice for students um but maybe we maybe we can save that to the end after some um questions and, and i'm not sure if i answered your question or not i think you did i think uh well i'm just wondering and so how does this work how do you because pic strikes me in its character and nature when i observe the employees there's a certain freedom to operate and an expectation that they will create as they go and respond. How do you create that environment? And what is your expectation of people innovating, you know, as they enter as young contributors to your business? Yeah, I, I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but it's another, you know, I, I don't sit around all day to read quotes, but I, I think an apt answer is, is another Steve Jobs quote, which is something along the lines of, uh, you know, we don't, um, hire smart people to tell them what to do we hire, we hire smart people so they tell us what to do <laughs> no i mean that mentality right of the autonomy on that so you know we try and be really clear and part of that i referred to tim earlier in that whole early development process that we understand what expectations are and what objectives are and all those things so we're on the same page but but we very much um want to foster autonomy and and that's you know Part of that actually is effective delegation, I think, and I, I maybe spend them just a minute on that because it, it was a lesson I had to learn um, as a technically trained person that um, I think it takes a lot of self-confidence to have the right sort of um, delegation. By delegation, I don't mean here's a list of things who's going to do them. I, I mean, how do we set things up where we have the right expectations, the right goals and objectives, to check in to make sure people are resourced properly and check in to see the results of that and course correct if you have to. Yeah. Uh, for, for me, when I came back from Europe, I, you know, I was a kind of world's expert, a world's expert in, uh, in PRS virus. And, and, you know, if I'm honest with myself, I'd say, you know, that feels pretty good. Sometimes you go into a situation and you're the expert. Well, I remember getting called in at one time on, on something and I couldn't go and, and Montserrat Tori Morel was working for me at the time could. And, and I remember me, thinking, you know, if you're really honest with yourself in the morning, looking in the mirror, hey, I could do that job 100%, but I think she can only do it 90. But a light bulb went on and I said, well, wait a minute, but if you have, you know, five of them, you're going to get 500% more things done. And oh, by the way, you can do more things and not just be an expert in one area. And that's not for everybody, right? But, but, mm -hmm. and, and really it told me you need to spend time with your people and developing your people and how do you get that 90 up to 120 or whatever, but, but critically to expand yourself. And so when you talk about, um, yeah, it's, it's that autonomy of, okay, we, we have a, we have a team goal and result and we break that up into pieces and people are responsible for different areas, but we really do um, let people go uh, run and make sure 
you know, as managers, we need to make sure people are resourced right, um, and that we check in, and 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 that that we try and and help uh, people succeed. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin. So, Bill, you mentioned that at one point of your career, somebody told you, you know, you're not a scientist, you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> After as much school <laughs> as you've been through, that's bound to sting a little bit, <laughs> but. You know, for what we do, we we create as part of our programs, you know, just these monikers of the farmer entrepreneur or the technology entrepreneur or the engineer entrepreneur. And, and so I, I like always thinking about the combination of it, you know, so as your career is went on from there, obviously your, your leadership capacity is is there. You're an entrepreneurial kind of a person, but I don't think that I don't think it's an either or, you know, it isn't that. You're, no, I and, and and if I could just comment on one thing you said about, you know, uh, I, 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 I talked about twelve years of post secondary education only to find <laughs> out I wasn't cited. I have absolutely never looked back on that to say that was time ill spent or geez, if I had just done this or I have a regret for that. It was a fantastic time. I mean, the people I met along the way and the you know, that entrepreneurial bit of the curiosity of different aspects of agriculture, in this case, animal agriculture and pigs. And remember, the industry itself is changing a lot during that time, too. So uh, I, I never looked back and said, you know, I should have done it this way or that way. I, I, it was what it was. And I, and I and I think within the business, I, I remarked earlier about degrees, I, I think there's a kind of tremendous amount of respect for for education and advanced degrees in this company. I, I talked about 120 people here in Hendersonville, about half of them are, are advanced degrees. Um, and, and I understand what it takes to get that and respect and honor that. But at the same time, it does not define people, right? I mean, it, you know, you've got to walk through the door. It, it, it opens the door, but you, you've got to, you've got to do the work and work, work through it. And we work with plenty of non-degreed people that, that do a lot of critical things for our business too. So, uh, you know, I, I, all that to say, I, I think, um, you know, you can be an entrepreneur in a lot of different ways and, and, and what you said, Kevin, and, and I'd echo that. You, know, you um, also, oh, you, I just have one question, a follow-up oh, question. Um, so you talked about being an entrepreneur and how exciting that is, and I totally agree. Um, but one quote that you left us with that I thought was brilliant was saying no to a thousand things, right? And our students are often coming out of college with a degree, sometimes multiple degrees if they, if they decided to double major. And they oftentimes have a lot of opportunities on the table. How, as a student, when you are young, you're excited, you're ready for the next thing, how do you decide what is the real thing? Because I think every two weeks, there could be a new opportunity. How do you learn to say yes? How do, how do you learn to say no? Are there di differentiating factors that you noticed and things that helped you? Like, What advice would you give to students to learn how to say no? I, I swear we didn't compare notes ahead of the time, right? But you, what you just said led me into some, something else I wrote here uh, under the heading of advice for students, right? In case I was asked. Um, number one, get started. The, the first job does not need to be perfect. Um, go where you can learn. I, you know, I, I think it happened to me, it's happened to, as I've raised children, we always want everything to be perfect. I, you know, the world isn't like that, right? And and part of it's just starting and and going. And and I think I, you know, I'd be attracted in that case to in particular people I could learn from um, much more than what is the very specific job. And that, number two, and and this is kind of what you're alluding to, you know, figure out what you like to do, <laughs> because you will gravitate towards that over time. And when I say what you like to do, I don't mean again the specific job. I mean, do you like dealing with people? Do you like dealing with data? Do you like, you, you know, what aspects of any kind of work do you enjoy? Because there's, there, I'm convinced you can fit in and contribute and, and be positive in a, a ton of different organizations. And that's a different set of decisions you can make along the way. But just get started, figure out what you want to do. And then the third thing, and this one's really tough. And I, I 
like, you know, most people I think struggle still with it all the time. And that is don't worry about what other people think of you. And, and that maybe is going to come across as kind of strange for people, but um, my, my final quote, I hope for today, it never ceases to amaze me. We all love ourselves more than other people, but care more about their opinions than ours. Marcus Aurelius. And so, you know, I, I really do think that the person and the opinion that matters is your own, right? And, and you have to be honest with yourself and, and uh, you know, have the integrity to, to care about that more than what all these, because I think, you know, it's probably always happened, but maybe even more in today's society, we get so hung up about, about what different people think on different uh, platforms, et cetera. I, you know, I, I just wouldn't spend time worrying about that, right? I'd get started, I'd figure out what you'd like to do, and I wouldn't worry about what other people think. And and go back to that issue I talked about failure. I mean, failure is not a disaster. If you learn from it, it's a good thing, right? It's a, the, the obstacle becomes part of, of what makes you as a person and, and, and gets you going. So um, that would be part of it. I and, and maybe another way to look at it is kind of, if I tried to boil down, what do I look for in a new hire? I mean, I, I, I again, I keep coming back to this curiosity thing. I think it's really, really important. Um, number two is determination. There's a lot of different ways you can define that and, and talk about it, but um, that that drive and persistence and um, ability to stick with things that that's really critical. And then, you know, the third thing is is more holistic. I will this person make the whole team better. Um, because ultimately we get judged on team success, not individual success. So, Bill, you talked about the importance of you know, curiosity and open-mindedness. <laughs> yeah, when I ask others, you know, what they admire in really successful and entrepreneurial people, I think that word curiosity probably comes up just as often as anything, you know, especially for Kind of those people that just keep going for decades and they just never stop and they're just energized by what's we all can sit back and admire that um and, and i don't know what the answer to this is and forgive me i'll, I'll try not to class that i teach which is taken mostly by agriculture major students not all but mostly um i have them take uh, a personality test just to, to kind of get to know themselves a little bit better and how they relate to, to I, others. I love those things, by the way. I've, I've taken multiple ones over the years. I'm just fascinated by them. And yeah, I do this, think it's part of being self-aware. Yeah. yeah. This one's the big five personality tests. And, the, and there's been a lot of work on kind of that and correlations with, you know, starting businesses. And so the two traits that are most associated with starting a business, and it's, again, it's a correlation, not a causation, but one is extroversion extroverted a person is, the more likely they are to start a business, going to be entrepreneurial. And I understand that. And students in my class tend to be, you know, because these traits are normally distributed across the population, as I understand it. But students in my class average like 74th percentile extroverted. So they're just really extroverted. And so you look at that and it's like, well, they enrolled in an entrepreneurship class. Maybe that has something to do with it. Um, but then the other one that's most associated with entrepreneurship is called openness to experience. And this is sort of the openness to new ideas and creativity. And they're really low, like 34th percentile on average or something. This has been consistent for the two or three years that I've given this, you know, and, you know, I've went to the company that supplies me with the test and said, have you ever looked at like regional differences to understand that this is like a Midwestern thing, you know, and, and I'll, work more on figuring it out but it's like maybe there's something about our industry <laughs> because we can get punished at certain times for trying new things and anyway i didn't know if you had any thoughts on that but i wonder if it's kind of feel your uh, uh, fear of failure <laughs> if that doesn't enter in too again it gets back to this thing that everything has to be perfect and it's not going to be you know and so so yeah here we are talking over video right it's not a perfect <laughs> Um, but but I but I think that can really hold people back. I know it's held me back. I, I mean, you uh, are adults or traders, you know. I mean, it, it, it really um, can hold people back. 
I might comment too. Uh, I think probably you're tend you would tend to be more risk adverse if you're dealing with live animals and live people. Where let's face it, the agriculture industry, other ecology, I think relies more on more unpredictable elements than any other industry I know. Right. So That's when you right, go talk about that. I mean, because how do you deal unpredictability of weather, animal disease? Uh, political situations, trade. I mean, uh, when you think about uh, innovation, even itself, um, you know, I'm wondering how much of that really, if you have a, a person who can tolerate less risk because of the amount of unpredictabil unpredictability in the industry. So just curious, Bill, I mean, how do you deal, how do you prepare innovators, you know, that are operating in this hugely unpredictable industry? Well, I mean, I'd maybe take a step back too and say, like with most everything, we also need balance, right? <laughs> if you just, you know, have nothing but full on, full speed ahead, optimistic entrepreneurs, you know, you're going to fail multiple times along the way. Balancing that with um, some, some, you know, uh, yeah, I would just say balance um, is, is probably. Uh, Underrated. Sometimes. Kevin or Madeline, we haven't heard from Madeline. Uh, Madeline, what questions might you have for Bill, especially as somebody that works in the industry as a young person? Well, you touched on the innovation, you know, with PIC being founded in Europe. How do you, a group of five big producers go from Europe to expanding into the North American market? And that's all about innovation, but how does that go about? It kind of ties into that point of the fear failure. They didn't know, but it proved to pay off tenfold. Yeah, well, yeah, a company's never about an individual, but in that phase, uh, that part of our company, it is about an individual, and his name was Ken Woolley. I mean, he absolutely was fearless when it came to failing. He had a sort of vision in mind, not just to apply that science uh, and everything else, but um, that it should be global, that it should be part of changing the industry, not not just, you know, hey, I want to go sell a bunch of something. And and, and he failed multiple times <laughs> around the world, right? And so the PIC had a patchy record for the first, you know, 15 years of its existence. Um, but that didn't stop him. It, it never did. And, and over time, through the combination of other individuals as well, that some of that balance that I'm talking about. Um, and, you know, we became a UK publicly traded company and had a parent company at the time that, that you know, could absorb some of the volatility of, of, of our business as we started. But uh, in, in that instance, very early on, the company started in 1962. It, it was in the UK until I think 68 or so it went to France um, and maybe Italy. But shortly thereafter that in 1970, they did a big contract with Bulgaria, with Bulgarian government, which was communist at the time. That was a big thing. They sold to this parent company called Dalgetty, which gave them capital. And immediately they went to starting in Germany. They started a business in 71 in Canada. They started US in 73. He firmly believed that the U.S. industry was was going to lead the way globally in, in the change in pig production, so much so that he moved here himself um, before you know there really was much of a business at all. And he brought a bunch of these kind of characters that I'm talking about, the Derek G's and the Andrew Coates's, and I can go on and on in the business. Of uh, a lot of more Brits, but but they came over and they were the kind of people that enjoyed. Um, that sort of atmosphere that he was creating and going, and they enjoyed changing things. And, and that's, that's really how the business came to be what it, what it was. And, and there's lots of individuals since that time that have had a huge impact. I mean, one, part of the success of PSC in, in North America is in the 90s, um, taking some risk with supply. We had a lot more supply of the right health gilts uh, compared to um, competitors and, and we grew tremendously during that time um, but it was always with a mindset of what's the industry going to look like 
three years, five years, 10 years out, because that's what we need to be focused on, not not, not the rearview mirror. Um, yeah. Well, I actually have a question. Um, so one of the common themes that I see across even the quotes that you're giving, you're talking about being able to take risks, um, accepting failure, um, the courage to change something that is successful. And I'm thinking about our students who are graduating, right? And they're getting maybe into their first real job and they're the youngest person at the table, right? Maybe they have a big idea. Maybe they wanna take risks. How do they balance company culture, seniority? Um, how do they balance the desire to actually want to learn and show people that they want to learn, but also say, hey, I think we can try this new thing. Hey, I know it's not broken, but I think I found a new way for us to be more successful. How do they balance all of that? <laughs> well, it I can give you a direct example related to what I've just been talking about because it, it, it happened to me. <laughs> um, so when I joined PIC, I, I, I was really lucky in a lot of ways because I sort of spanned the generations in the company. I've been with PIC 27 years now. And so um, some of the, orig the original technical director, Morris Bouchard is the guy who I went to work for. But Ken Woolley, this founder I keep talking about, he had just left the business, had retired from active business. One of the projects I got involved in right away, even though I was meant to be doing some vet research on the side, was to set up a, a, a nucleus structure and multiplication structure for a, a company called Agro Industries Yucatan um, in obviously the Yucatan, a big new multi-site, Hank had designed that multi-site production system in, in Yucatan in Mexico. So I flew down there to help negotiate this deal and, and work on it with, with a more senior colleague in the company. But at the same time, Ken Woolley flew down and he was actually consulting for Raul Casares, the owner of Agro Industries Yucatan. So in, in a way, we were sort of on different, different sides of the table. And somewhere during that first day, um, we had a session and I can't even remember the specifics about what we were talking about, but it was multiplication flow or something. And I told him what I thought. And this is with this company, Agri Industrial Jukatan's management team, and and uh, Ken, Ken and I, and I, and I said what I thought, and Ken absolutely tore me down. I'm not saying that's a great leadership style. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. But I mean, he just, you know, I won't, I won't swear here, but uh, let's say <laughs> there was some swearing done of just what kind of an idiot I was. This young, wet behind the ears, didn't know any better, and. Truly, I didn't know any better because I thought I was right. And so I was polite. He is my elder. <laughs> and, and, and I waited till he finished. And I got up on the whiteboard and I drew out why I thought what I told him made sense. And I can't even remember how we decided in the end. But what I do know is that night we were sitting around in Merida and, and where they have these, you know, kind of umbrellas and you sit by the pool. Um, after dinner, and and he came over with a fairly significant jug and stuck it in front of me and said, "I need to get to know you." <laughs> so I, I, in that case, to go back to try and answer your question, I, I think you know, yeah, you, you, you know, you, you shouldn't be obnoxious about it or totally contrary. And I don't think that's the wrong way, but you know, you, you know, you have tremendous new people in a business and young people in a business have a fantastic amount to add simply because it's a new way of thinking about a problem or an issue or a new idea. And, 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 you know, yeah, if you are in a business where that's not appreciated, I think that's a problem because, because to, to me, that's a huge part of how businesses succeed is you have to constantly renew the thinking and, and people should not, your, your new graduates should not be bashful about that. Do it the right way, do it appropriately, et cetera. That example I gave you probably isn't the right one, but it, it is a real life example. It did happen to me. It's a great, great story. Well, I think, Bill, that also relates to what you talked about, saying create positive change, but the world sometimes resists, <laughs> maybe a lot. And for a young person, I think a lesson on how to deal with that, you know, comes from your story of 
you know, be polite, but that doesn't mean abandon your thought, try to articulate it in a different way and exactly see right. if another conversation can happen. You know, what, what other tools and strategies do you think there are for young people to deal with just resistance to, to change and the world being different and new ideas? Yeah, I don't know if I have a good answer to that. I, I uh, yeah, you know, there's a <laughs> Carnegie's book was written in the 1930s, wasn't it? How to Win Friends and Influence People. I still, I went to an egg seminar some few years ago in in, in Harvard, and and it was it was still on the preferred reading list, right? I don't think it's been topped. And people like to do business with uh, people who. Are pleasant and they enjoy being with and and yeah a lot of it is simply a repackaging of the golden rule right people who want to be treated the way you know that you should treat people the, the way you want to be treated and, and and i think that takes you a long way so if if you go back to what you just said what are other tools and things i think constantly we have to um first of all listen and that's at least in my case, it has to be an active process. <laughs> so, I mean, really, truly listen, because that's the start of putting yourself in the other person's shoes and and uh, understanding where they're coming from. So if you're going to change a mentality and bring new ideas in, you, you better understand, you know, kind of what you're up against. Tell it, let me put it that way. Um, and, and, and to do that, you really need to listen. You really need to put yourself in the other person's shoes, you know. Maddie, Maddie, do you have uh, more questions for us? Yes, I was going to, you mentioned always think about what the industry is going to look like in a year, three years, five years. How do you suggest that students develop that forward looking mentality or have any suggestions on how to look at things from that analytical sense to analyze them going forward? Yeah, I, I think there's probably a number of ways, Maddie, to get at that answer. I mean, I, I, you know, part of it is the, the people you interact with in the industry and the kind of companies they're in and changing. Um, part is also looking at related industries too. I mean, the, the classic one we keep going back to in our world is is, is brothers, right? I mean, you know, we're, you know, if you look at kind of how agriculture has consolidated and become more professional around the world and animal agriculture in particular, you know, it started with broilers and layers and you got into turkeys and then pigs and it's kind of happening pretty fast right now in dairy too i would say besides the back end of the beef thing the front end is still you know extremely fragmented so i i think you know and i'm not saying that's the only example you'd use but but those industry changes a ton of them are applicable to ours um i i still you know there's been a, there's been a big trend in the 30 years i've been in the business of consolidation right um there's been part of a trend towards integration and, and that's happened in different directions, right? And it doesn't necessarily mean total integration, but you're seeing a bunch of that. I mean, the, the Triumph model, I, I guess would be a classic creative one where, um, you know, four key producer groups came together to help get directly involved in processing. I, I, I think we, we keep going further down that value chain to be the processing and where where brand value gets created in either the processing itself or ultimately in the retail or food service. I think, um, you know, the shift, the, the big shift in the industry is, is towards that. It's towards the consumer ultimately. And so I, I think, you know, not being blind to that stuff and not sticking to, well, this is the way we always used to do it. Um, I, I think you have to, you have to adapt and you have to understand how that comes forward. And, you know, nobody's got a perfect crystal ball, right? But but I think just making sure that you're looking at those kind of trends. You know, a big one right now, I think, in our industry to be looking at is alter, alternate proteins, right? What is ultimately going to happen on that? I, I happen to think it's a, the whole protein space is huge, right? And so uh, there's, there's room for everybody. And, uh, but, but uh, you know, there's some underlying trends there around, you know, and it's not, necessarily at least the vegetable based ones aren't necessarily vegetarian driven although some of them would be but it's there's other aspects of it that that, that are taking place and then of course you have 
some technology, core technology things going on, uh, the sort of lab meat, cell culture based stuff. But you know, those are just big examples, I think, of things that we need to be constantly have our radar up on. Bill, I have a follow up question for you because a critical component where, as you said, um, students, while young people in general and people in our industry, it's no longer being a technician is enough, no longer technical expertise. Uh, we're finding that people also have to almost uh, do social innovation and socialize the ideas and be responsible for awareness and help creating awareness, especially in the area of agriculture, where um, consumers are asking for more and more information about where their food comes from and so on and so forth. Can you speak to some things that um, PIC uh, has done as it relates to, you know, creating awareness and an awareness campaign about product? Um, where are your people working in that area? Yeah, we, we would have a ton of initiatives around the world. Um, part of that is the sort of community-based efforts that we do. We're working directly with some of our direct customers who are producers or processors um, in, in a lot of different ways uh, to, to tell that story better. I still don't think we do it very well or it isn't widespread as much as it should be. I mean, I... I, I I um I I see it more when you look at adoption of of new technologies and the and the fundamental changes new technologies can bring. The classic one being gene editing when we're making a you know five uh, base pair deletion out of an entire three and a half billion genome and it makes a huge difference in the animal. I think that's a natural evolution and progression of of selective breeding, but. I don't make that decision. Ultimately, the, the 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 public and the people really have the brand risk do, and so I I, I think, yeah, I, I struggle sometimes, Karen, because you know, like Norman Borlaug is a hero of mine, <laughs> you know, but he wouldn't be seen as a hero. I think in today's world across the board, but you know, I I just think it's phenomenal what the responsible application of technology can do to agriculture. You, you look at so many of the the misconceptions, uh, just falsehoods out there that were depleting soil and 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 polluting, et cetera. If if you look at how precision ag has has advanced that, how genetics, how how a lot of the technology mm -hmm. to be able to to uh, use precision ag, how how much more sustainable on an efficiency basis we are. Um, it it's. Uh, I think it's a phenomenal story, but you know we're, we're up against it, right? Because you know what is it? Can't even be one percent anymore of, of American populations involved in agriculture, right? And you know, yeah. World War II it would have still probably been ten percent, um, but it, it so it's an uphill battle on yeah. that. And I, I think you know we have to be factual. Um, we have to explain the benefits of things, why we do the things that we do, um, and and not not be uh, I'd not be afraid to tell that story, right? I, I, you know, it's interesting on airplanes. I, if I sit next to somebody and they ask me what do I do, if if, if I, I've learned not to say it veterinarian because ultimately <laughs> they'll launch into a story about their dog or cat. And I, 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 I'm patient. I wait till the end, and then the ultimate question is, well, what should I do with you know this dog or cat? And I tell them I take you to a veterinarian. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> You have no idea that there's specialization in veterinary medicine. But anyhow, the, the, the flip side, you really want to get some people uncomfortable. You, you, you say you work in genetics. They, they just go like that, right? You're mm -hmm. Frankenstein, right? And then you put it in the context of, hey, wait a minute. You know, for millennia, people have been measuring animals, selecting the best males, the best females together to make the next generation. That, that's what we do, what, what humans have been doing for 10,000 years now. You know, our tools are more technologically advanced or complex or all those things, but that same basic idea that that's what we're doing. And then I think people begin to settle down a little bit more and you can have a discussion about well, what do you select for and why and those kinds yeah. of things. Um, yeah. We, we are doing a session on November 12th, by the way, uh, listeners and Bill, uh, with C.S. Liu, who's from Thailand, I believe, Kevin, right? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and um, he is the CEO of Pacific AgriScience, and he's going to be speaking on alternative food source, um, as it alternative agriculture, and talking about exactly some of the things that you bring up. So I just wanted to 
and of course, everyone is invited. Kevin, can you continue with our questions? Yeah, um, Bill, I'm just really interested in this whole thread of discussion, you know, about <laughs> genetics, because it is such a big deal. And, and even the history of PIC is having European roots, but then, you know, coming here, but being global, you know, the genetic modification in crop, obviously Europe just completely rejected that. And, you know, they apply what they call the precautionary principle, which to me at least, means nothing changes, you know, and, and then there's been some ruling on, you know, gene editing, but there's such huge potential for doing good things in human health and livestock health with gene editing. And I, and you know, I've traveled in Europe and I know that it's, it's not just a political thing, it's a deep cultural sort of questioning and I, and I appreciate that, but how do you see this all playing out with the tremendous potential that technology is going forward with consumer acceptance, the complexities of international trade and, you know, shipping products around. I mean, I'm trying to take this in a couple of different ways, Kevin. Start with, the, you know, the changes that have been made. I, I, I listened to a talk the other day about uh, the, the dairy industry. In 1950, in the U.S., there were 25 million dairy cows. Mm -hmm. And today there's 9 million dairy cows and those 9 million dairy cows produce 60% more milk than the 25 million did. Wow. There's actually more horses in the United States right now than there are dairy cows. Wow. So, so that tells you, and it's not genetics alone. Genetics have a huge component of it, but it's, but it's, you know, nutrition and production practices and husbandry practices, et cetera, but phenomenal change. You could say the same thing right across agriculture. Um, you know, in the pig world, if I, just look on a throughput basis, and there's a lot of different ways to look at this. In my tenure in PSC, and certainly I don't mean this because of me, uh, but just as it happened while I was here, I mean, our base genetic package has doubled in output in, in, in one person's career lifetime. I mean, it's just phenomenal what's possible. And yes, these tools make it more precise and more efficient to do that going forward. You ask about, about Europe, uh, you know, we're a UK publicly traded company. It, that, that's a little bit unique, right? Because of Brexit now, but even before Brexit, I mean, the Brits, are, it's not quite the same as the continent, the way they've approached technology over time. Um, but, you know, part of it is some regional food sort of, and not just the food itself, but rearing practices and stuff go back centuries and centuries, right? Think of Parma ham or think, you know, th think some of those things and, and, and are worth you know, protecting and preserving. And I get that, right? Part of it is, um, and this is just my opinion, it's certainly not the opinion of the company, but part of it, I think, is just uh, protectionism, right? So um, even within Europe right now, if you look at the pig industry, so those of you on the call might not know, African swine fever had been moving west from Russia into Eastern Europe, into Poland. It was at the German border. Well, here a couple months ago, it jumped into Germany. And immediately, Germany was the number one exporter to Asia from Europe, and that shut off immediately because of ASF. It's in wild boars, by the way, not in domestic pigs. And they, they're under a strict control program, but it's it's there. So what's happened, you, you know, globally, you have winners. It's, it's helped on our U.S. market, but certainly Brazil. Um, but even within Europe, you, you see this shift from Northern Europe to Southern Europe, to, to, uh, to Spain in particular. But it isn't that event alone. That's, that's been happening over a few decades, and it's accelerating. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, Northern Europe has a ton of tradition in, in, if you actually look at the development of technology and pig production, a lot of it's come from Northern Europe, but um, they're not competitive uh, for, for grain and, and, and protein soybeans. And, you know, if you look at just the structure of the industry itself, scale wise, with the exception of processing, they've, they've continue to lose competitiveness. So on a global basis, if, and there isn't, but if there were truly free trade, you, you know, Europe, with the exception of Spain, just couldn't compete. 
globally. It couldn't compete with the Americas from Canada to Argentina. It's not just the U.S., right? Um, and, and, you know, it gets even more extreme with, with China, right? Before ASF, it was more than double to raise a pig in China compared to the U.S. Um, you know, there, there was a period here last summer where it was over sixfold, almost sevenfold the pricing in China versus the price in the U.S. You know, again, I don't, I'm not living in a bubble or Pollyanna. I think, you know, we're all just going to have perfectly logical free trade. But, it, you know, if there was, the economics are on our side in the Americas. There's no question on that. And so go back to your question on Europe. Um, yeah, the, you, you know, I suppose there's something deeper culturally, and this is just my experience having lived in Europe for five years. Um, I, I was really struck, and I would encourage any of your students, if you can live outside the country for a period of time, it's a great thing for, for us as a family. And I just think you look at your own country in a different way, positive, positive and negative, right? I'm not doing all the other, but as far as approaches to things and working in a business, I, I, I was really struck Growing up in the U.S. or upper Midwest, uh, at least in my family, you hear about can-do attitude and stuff, and it's just a cliche, right? You don't even think about it. I mean, it's real. The difference in approach, in my experience in Europe, you know, an American group and a European group can both agree on an end goal, right? And for the next half hour, the European group might, and I, I'm doing gross stereotypes here, so uh, I apologize ahead of time to people, but I'm trying to make a point. There would be all kinds of different ways of, of talking about things that could go wrong or mistakes. It was it was a very prudent, the European, uh, in my experience, was a very imprudent, uh, don't make as many mistakes approach. Whereas the American approach is what we've been describing today, you know, hurry up and go faster and, and we'll adjust in, as we need to on the way. I mean, and... I don't think necessarily one's better than the other, right? It's just, they're just different approaches. And it's not universal. I'm sure you could use a ton of examples the other direction. But that was my take on the whole thing. And I can tell you, for me personally, what's more fun to work in is, is the American approach. <laughs> but I'm biased. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if we might pull in our international stakeholder here, Anna Lush. I wonder what questions you might have, because I'm sure you can identify to different and diverse approaches to innovation and within industry. Uh, Anna, some thoughts from you? By the way, before Anna responds, I, I need to let her know that we, uh, <laughs> that, we, that we help run the breeding program for the Iberian Ham Association in Spain. Ooh, okay. Come on, Serrano. Yeah, oh, that's, no, I, I, I agree with you 100%. I would go even deeper because Europe is a collection of different cultures. So for me, uh, my past decade was in the Netherlands and everything is hands-on approach. The day I arrived, I already were put in a project. Uh, the entrepreneurial mindset, the trading, the pirates, you know, like, so my, and all the other countries before, England and Portugal and Spain, and everything needs to be very prudent. It's really like well thought of, like uh, we usually say that the culture of the British, like they do a meeting about the meeting and, uh, <laughs> And I, I really appreciate what you're saying because since I arrived, I have that feeling. I do have a comment between academia and industry. I find academia here a little bit more prudent and I find uh, industry faster and the other way around over there. But to agree. this, yeah, but to, the, to your point, I think for our students, I agree with your comment that we should live abroad. I want to kick my kids out of the house as soon as they hit 15. Um, I, I really agree that you need to experience a different culture so that you really understand what is diversity of thought. And you talked about that many times. I am very curious by one thing that you said in the beginning that you did the personality inventory, which is something that we talk with other speakers as well. Um, knowing who you are and that you were surprised to figure it out that you were an entrepreneur and the fact that you like to experience mm -hmm. other cultures and diversity. It's not that you are an entrepreneur, but you are, and I'm going to quote you, you are courageous, you are curious, <laughs> you, are, you like hard work because you mentioned that in the beginning as your influencers. So for our students, um, my question would be, 
not so much the stereotypes. It's okay to generalize and stereotypes, but would your biggest recommendation be go and experience the different ways of doing things? Because I, I find that in all your conversations, what you're looking at is different modes of doing things. It's not our concepts of innovation, but it's just like go and try different ways of doing things. I, I note that as as you talk. Yeah, that I, that is I, I the thought biggest of it thing. that way, Anna, but I, but I think you're absolutely right because then that you, you, you're actually seeing different approaches and what works and what doesn't work or what how can you modify one approach with the other approach kind of yeah. kind of thing and i i think uh you know the international part that you touched on i i um yeah i i, I sometimes say it this way and i'm not very good at humor but i'll try it that i had children in, <laughs> you in, are. In, i had children in three countries for pic yeah and then i remind people with the same spouse but, uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and, I'm similar. I can do that. I have one in England, one in the Netherlands, and one almost here in, in America. Yeah, um, there you go. I, we, did, we did the same, Germany and England, and uh, one here. My wife is from Mexico. So. There you go. So I, I like it. You said that um, innovation for you, it's not about the, ch the shiny projects, but the way that you can actually put innovation in the business model. Again, that's why I'm thinking that your innovation space is in the processes, in the modes of operating and allow other peoples to come and say, oh, I have a different way of doing this. And um, that has been for me, like the most inspiring thing about your talk is like, who dares wins and you dare to do it differently. And I think as for our students, that's a very, it's a hard thing to have uh, in your personalities. Like you dare to try different things. And I am very happy that they have the chance to hear you saying that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think part of that, Anna, goes to a mindset that you really are too insignificant to mess anything up. <laughs> really, I think that that's kind of the um, uh, if you can remember that in the whole world of things, you really it's very hard, especially as a young person, to make a mistake that's really going to mess things up radically. With it, you don't, you don't have any students in. Uh... In uh, nuclear power plants, do you? Oh, no, we don't, <laughs> right? We, uh, I think that this is really true. I think that um, we both, uh, uh, two things that we have to keep in mind as we innovate. One, we can do, because we really can't mess anything up, we have all this permission and invitation to experiment, explore, and exploit. And so we can do significant things, but we can't do significant things if we feel like we're going to mess everything up. I mean, innovation in itself is really messy. Bill, I'm wondering if you might share an experience where you didn't, where you were missing a lot of the information, didn't know the answers, and really just kind of had to dive in and create it as you go. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that. Tell us the most courageous and hard, prompt <laughs> failure in your face kind of thing that then you said, oh, I'm going to go and do it anyway. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I gave a couple of examples already. I'm just trying to think of, is there a different one? Oh, no, I but know. those were sort of safe. Your decision-making process was <laughs> evident. We want the one that you say like, yeah, that didn't go well. So yeah. the students well, also I, see I, I, that, I, I, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you something. Hmm. Um, I don't want to put you in the spotlight. No, I, I, I look I do. Um, um, <laughs> This happened. To, it's happened to me more than once, and I, I, I'm not a superstitious person. I, I like to think I carry at least that much scientist left in me. But um, <laughs> uh, I, I think you have to act on hunches, and and by that I mean um, you have to chase them down because mm. if you don't, they can like haunt you. <laughs> and and, yeah. and you know, again, I. I don't think you live your life full of regrets, but if you go back and think about things, and there's lots of people that have talked about you regret, you know, chances you didn't take more than you did failures, but but usually if there's a hunch, at least for me, and I think yeah. I'm different than most people, there's some underlying thing in there that that you just it, and and it won't all be right, you know, but you just have to. You have to run them down. You know what I mean. And and yeah. I mean there there were a couple of things. There there was in, in the middle of that 
kind of virus hunt for, for PRS. I mean, there, there was some fascinating stuff. We, we had that virus isolated like a year before it was published and didn't know it because we didn't stick it back wow. in the state. <laughs> and, yeah. was Minnesota and, and it's like, you knew that was right. And I was getting the advice, my advisor was saying, hey, stop this, get to work on your regular stuff. And it's like, no, but you know, you should have just followed through on that. And again, I, I don't, it's what it is. I, I just use it as an example um, of yes. you should follow up on hunches on things. Um, yeah. yeah, really, really good advice, I think, too. And, uh, you know, um, I know, Kevin, you're not the center of our interview today, but Kevin is one of my hunch heroes. Mm. Uh, right. And um, because he will go out there and he has a feeling it's not very clarified. Kevin, can you give an example of a hunch? where you didn't necessarily have all the answers or the right support, but you you went headlong. Well, I think the big one for me is just, yeah, when I'm four years into my career working for a company where I enjoyed it most days, I couldn't stop thinking about starting my own business. And, you know, earlier in that year, it's been a long time ago now, 1996, Patty was pregnant with her second child and, she wasn't paid very much as an adjunct instructor at Iowa State University and wasn't having much fun. And so she said, you know, I'm not going to even be paying for daycare when we have the second one in daycare. Um, so can I quit my job and pursue my aspiration as an artist and a designer? And so I said, yes. Well, then like six months later, I'm like, hey, honey, can I quit my job too? <laughs> So it took a little bit of discussion. I mean, I remember driving between Des Moines and Angus for my commute that summer of 1996, my 1986 Buick Regal, listening to Hootie and the Blowfish on a cassette tape, just thinking, am I mentally cracked? Like, and I remember speaking to my dad and he's just like, I think it's a really bad idea to quit your job. <laughs> you know? and, so, but yeah, it's sort of the thing that you just can't get rid of, whether it's a hunch about PERS and Bill's case that maybe you should have pursued a little bit further, or should I quit my job to do something else, or should I do an experiment, or you know, whatever. It's like, can you, can you push back against your intuition or that hunch, and does it keep pushing back? And if yeah. it goes back, for long enough, then maybe it's something you really need to listen to. Yeah. Well, I think that, is that if you're not innovating. Oh, go ahead, Bill. I was just going to say, I think the intuition piece of that, because, you know, yeah, might, it might be a better way of saying that. I mean, in, in my experience, <laughs> that, that typically um, people with really good intuition, either it's of cells are surrounded by data and are analytical, or they have people they work with quite closely that, that are that. I mean, th there is a basis for intuition. I'm convinced of that in, in, in our career. I can tell you, I can tell you, I was going to say that. So for <laughs> our students, delicious students, um, there's a gentleman called David, uh, oh, Daniel um, Kenaham, and he wrote a book that the typed font is very, very small, so you don't want to read it. But just talk and explore a little bit something called the systems one and systems two. And our intuition, this gut that we're talking about, this hunch, this in design, we call it the bug list and creativity. Like you have a bug. There's something there that you want to pursue. It really exists as part of your thinking process. It's a systems one. But most of the time, it's given to you by your entrepreneurial spirit, by your innovative spirit, that you are not totally convinced by the way things are. And you keep asking yourself, like, what if? Mm, what if I isolated the virus? What if, you know, like, I have it there. And it's this, um, like Karen was introducing to you, the innovation mindset of putting yourself in the position of a question and not just like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to explore this, but it's uh, the inquisitive mind. And when we say, I had a gut, I have an instinct, I have an un hunch, it's because in your mind, what's happening is that you have a question. You have something that you like, you don't know the answer yet. And that's quite important. So I, I wrote it big, Bill, I'm going to quote you. Like, 
act on anches. <laughs> and we're going to quote you in the next time that we speak about systems one and systems two. It's really something that uh, we, we should explore more in our conversations. Um, I, I also want, if I can, just make a final comment because all our speakers, and you started like that, all our speakers, when they start telling their story, they always say that the beginning of the beginning was learning on the job, doing something, like, uh, and you talked about family of 10 and the hard work and doing the thing. And we had other speakers saying, I look for the hardest. I look for the thing that it's most difficult to go with. And I really wanted to wrap up with that, Bill, and thanking you to sharing your story, that your beginning and now the way that we are reflecting about, it's all about going and doing, like you do it, you, you try and do things. And I really appreciate that. That's a very good takeaway for our students. Um, Bill, final words from you? Yeah. Well, I, I, again, I just want to thank everybody. And, and uh, yeah, I, I'm really humbled by the opportunity to, to do this and, and, you know, recognize we rely on Iowa State for a, a, a huge chunk of our new talent acquisition yeah. this year. So shout out for that. But, uh, um, yeah, I, I just, um, I, I don't know. I, I've tried to describe kind of what I've gone through. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say in my way is any sort of playbook. We all have to find our own way. But um, part of that is is having confidence in yourself and finding your own way. And, and, you know, that's an easy thing to say. It's a harder thing to do. But ultimately, that's that's what we all got to get our head around. And, and that that confidence will, will, will take you far. So, yeah. yeah. I want to wrap up. Nakaya, did you have one more question? I did. Um, and this was going to be um, really for Bill and kind of Kevin, but I know that we're short on time. So I kind of want to know what are three words to describe the next generation of ag leaders? I know, Kevin, you're in the classroom, Bill. Um, you're you're working as a CEO right now. Um, and I know, Kevin, you're an entrepreneur as well. So what are you all seeing? What are some characteristics or traits or um, adjectives to describe this next vibrant generation of leaders? You want to go first, Kevin? Yeah, gosh, yeah, that's a good question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and I think there's a lot of things to it, but Bill had described earlier sort of the consumer influence on what we're doing in agriculture. And, you know, we've got, so many students that are interested or actually working on more direct con to consumer type models and you know we've seen that work with triumph but we're you know we're seeing it with more niche production and things like that and you know my point to students is that it's really hard to be a successful agricultural producer it's really hard to be a successful processor it's really hard to be a successful distributor or consumer marketing sort of a company you put all those things together you know, if I have to use one word, I won't come up with three, but I'll just say like ninja. I mean, it just takes these oh, skills. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, super good. And, and so I, you know, I think our ag entrepreneurs is just very ninja-like in their approach to attack attacking these opportunities that are available because consumers are looking back into agriculture and saying, bring it on. This is what I want. Yeah. Bill, what about you? I don't know if I have a very good one. I, I talked about it before, kind of around the curiosity. You said three yeah. words of determination. I think is 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 really important. Um, yeah, and, and and this element of team. I I, I can't tell you. And, and different things motivate different people, right? But one of my key motivators, you know, autonomy is a key motivator for me. Um, so I, I help kind of. Karen talked about it before. Exude that hopefully the people that work with me but uh, the ability to sort of master something um, is is important for me um, but the third thing is you know it, I think it's really key to be part of something bigger than yourself and and for me I know a lot of people in agriculture want to relate to the you know feed the world aspect of that I, I quite frankly that that's not what drives me. I mean, if I think about it long enough, it's, it's a noble thing. Don't get me wrong. I think it's, it's, but it's, for me, it's more like the team you're working with succeeding, being part of something you can do 
you, you couldn't do on your own. You could do together far more effectively. Mm -hmm. That is really powerful. If, if you can, if you can be part of something bigger than yourself, um, and, you know, kind of check the ego at the door to, to get that done. That, that's really pretty critical. That's a great point to end on, Bill. And I think something really mindful, um, especially in a time where people are very divided, just to remind us that we are, we want to be driven more toward the center to work together with that diverse population. And PIC has a long history of bringing people in very deliberately and compelling them to bring their unique talents and work forward. So I honestly, in my experience, because I've known a lot of PIC employees and uh, students who feel inspired when they join your team and inspired to really be something, part of something bigger than themselves. So I appreciate that. Um, and I know Tim Heiler is a great leader and somebody who really does a great job with young people. And I imagine they can find information to connect with Tim at some point in your organization, probably on your website, right? Yep. Right? If, if and, Tim's doing his job, and he always does, he already is working with them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, I do want to announce our next uh, flagship innovator is David Slump, President of Global Market Strategy and Services at Harman. And David actually does so much with us. Um, and if you're really smart, the night before, on Thursday night, he is doing something called product management. Of course, Bill, your people are also uh, welcome to attend. The Brutal Realities of Product Management. And he and Andy Sui from China are going to be talking about really in very straightforward terms how difficult and challenging it is, but also how to negotiate and navigate that world of taking something, an innovation from beginning to end, all the way through the innovator cycle. So uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you next week. And as I said, we do innovation for students, by students, with students. These were some of your requests to uh, people that you want to see in the industry. And I thank you for joining us. And Bill, just amazing. Kevin, thank you for hosting. Maddie, also for um, uh, being on the road and being with us at the same time. And we will see you next week. Innovation for anyone, anywhere. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Happy Halloween.